morning. Good morning. Are we on? There we go. Well, we have a full schedule today, and uh, we would like everyone to take their bulletins out just for a moment and go over a few things. Today is Move Up Sunday, and so we got all the Sunday school classes except for the, the uh, college and career. Once you get to college and career, you don't move up anymore unless you decide to come in here. <laughs> okay, well, some of y'all are in here. Okay, but anyway, this is Move Up Sunday. Uh, but if you have your bulletins, let me just mention a few things before we get to that. Um, this coming Saturday, May the 7th, Notes of Spring, piano recital at 10 o'clock in the morning, lunch to follow. There's a sign-up sheet in the vestibule. Today's the last day to sign up, okay? We need to get the idea of how many's coming because there's food for lunch. And if you'd like to come and listen to some of our young people play the piano and uh, You'll get to see what they've been learning, and it'll be a joyful time. I know you'll enjoy that if you have a free Saturday morning. Um, on the 8th, we have Mother's Day next Sunday, and the mothers were delighted to honor you. We have also missionary Edgar Fagali with us, and you are not going to want to miss him. I, I hope that you'll be here morning for Sunday school. He's going to speak in Sunday school and I hope you'll be back at 6 o'clock at night because he's going to share some of the stories. Uh, he is a missionary to the Middle East. Brother Fagali is Lebanese. He has dual citizenship in America and in Lebanon. And uh, you're talking about this is one of those guys that gets to go to in places where most people can't get into. Okay, And so he's a veteran at it. And uh, we're going to have a great time with him on the 8th. We have a baptism scheduled for Sunday the 15th. And that'll be right after the morning service. We'll go over to the fellowship hall. We've got about five to baptize. And then um, we ha we're actually going to have to have another baptism as well because of scheduling. We're going to do another baptism in June. Uh, but God has been good in that regard. And then uh, deacons, the Lord's Supper will be, let's see, what's the Sunday after the 15th? 22nd. The 22nd will be uh, the Lord's Supper. Uh, today, uh, we'll also take the children's change offering in the morning service. And don't forget, right after the service, we have a Teen Extreme fundraiser for our young people going to camp, and they're going to serve you. It's like a sit-down restaurant in the fellowship hall. They're going to serve you. You don't even have to get up and go get a drink. Um, and I promise you, the service will probably be better than most restaurants. And I know the food's going to be good because my wife made it, okay, or at least some of it. And so uh, that's going to be a great time. And so if you say, well, preacher, I, you know, lasagna is not my thing. Well, I don't understand that for number one. But if lasagna isn't your thing and you'd like to make a donation, then there'll be a bucket out there for the kids. Uh, one of them will be there at that. All right, so that's right after the morning service. Let's say our verse of the month, Matthew 5, 16, together this morning. Matthew 5, 16. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Matthew 5, 16. All right, I want to recognize a few folk today. Um, our primary class uh, consists of Troy, Theo, James, Luke, Micah, Selma, and Oakland. And Miss Olivia teaches that class. Miss Olivia, would you stand so we could everybody could see you and you could be embarrassed. And we appreciate uh, Miss Olivia. Thank you. Also... Yes, also, uh, junior class, Miss Michelle, if you would please stand. Is she in here? There she is. She's hiding behind Ralph. Uh, Miss Michelle's been doing this a long time. Her class is Emily, Kaylee, Emma, Adrian, Brandon, Kale, Todd, Noah, Zane, and then Dylan is going to be moving up today. Dylan, would you stand? You're moving up to Miss Michelle's class today. All right, so you're an official junior class member. Miss Michelle, we appreciate your labor. And uh, I say labor, it's really a joy to teach Sunday school. When you get to impact young people, it's a joy. And then uh, we established this rule if you uh, here within the last year or two, I can't remember, I've slept since then, but uh, 
we want to have a junior church for kids, but there comes a point where a kid is old enough to sit in the service and start listening to the preaching, and so we made that age 10. So Brandon, Adrian, Zane, Samuel, and Hannah will move up into the auditorium, and you get to hear me every Sunday morning. Yay, all right, wonderful. All right, and then moving up to the teen class is Tyler, Ralden, and Rachel Allison. All right, and so... Tyler and Rachel, you got to stand since I made Dylan stand. Yeah, all right. There's the new teenagers. Yay, all right. Okay, and so teen class, you will be in the fellowship hall today because y'all got to uh, do some things there. We don't want kids destroying all that's been set up. And so all the kids class, junior class, Miss Michelle, you guys will be in the teen class today. All right? And we just want to say thank you to our teachers. I know that sometimes Sunday school teachers probably are some of the least recognized folk in a local church. Uh, oh, by the way, Stephen, I mean, I can't leave you out. Stephen's our college and career Sunday school teacher, and he's holding Theo, so I won't make you stand. But uh, we appreciate all of our teachers. We really do. And, you know, you have to prepare. You have a family. You have a job. And these, these people put time in to prepare a lesson for their classes. And uh, we just want to say thank you to all of our Sunday school teachers and those who helped. I know Sabrina substituted. My wife's been a Sunday school teacher. And uh, I know the Raldens do Patch and Pee Wee and so forth. But we, we thank God for all the people he has sent our way to be a part of Sunday school. Let's give them a hand. All right. Without further ado, kids, you are dismissed to your classes. All right. Also, let me mention uh, the Kolb Kennedy Memorial Missionary Scholarship. Today is the last day if you'd like to give toward that. Uh, Ambassador has their graduation coming up, and we need to get a check sent to them. And the way that works is our, we budget $1,000 out of our missionary budget, and we give people the opportunity if you'd like to contribute to that. And that scholarship goes to a young person at Ambassador Baptist College who has to do a missions internship somewhere around the world. And they, uh, this helps them get there. And I know Larry and Paul both uh, were men that loved missions and loved uh, to see souls saved. And so this, is, this just helps somebody uh, continue that education and get to that point where they can maybe one day go out on the mission field if the Lord so leads. And so that will be uh, today. I wanted to mention that. All right. And then the last, uh, this is not in the bulletin, but the last Sunday of this month, the 29th, um, the Robertsons will be moving to Kentucky. And so I hate to see them go. And they've also been helping with the college and career class. Um, but they're going to be moving back uh, closer to Dallas's parents. And so we're going to have a fellowship after the evening service on May the 29th. So that's why we moved the Lord's Supper up to the 22nd. All right, let's take our Bibles then this morning. And we're going to have a fun lesson today. Maybe you'll... We're going to start in 1 Chronicles chapter 2. 1 Chronicles chapter 2. If I, if I had sent an email out, if I had had Pat do this, you may not have come to Sunday school today because the email would, would have said, today we're going to study some of the genealogies in the scripture. And you'd have said, no thanks. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, you know, in these genealogies, they are difficult to wade through, but they are in scripture for a reason. It provides concrete proof of the lineage of Christ, for example, which is one of the major reasons they're in there. But there's also some little tidbits and things, you know, names had meanings and so forth. And there's, there's little verses uh, intertwined throughout some of these genealogies that are very important. And so let me ask you this question before we get to our text. How many of you this morning, and this is a little bit in jest, has heard of Abraham. Anybody, anybody heard of Abraham? Okay, great, wonderful, wonderful. How many here today has heard of a man named Moses? Anybody, anybody? Good, good, good. We're two for two. How many of you have heard of uh, a fellow named Jonah? Anybody? Okay, a lot of people, good. How about Elijah? All right, good, good. We're four for four. 
Uh, David, anybody? Anybody? Five for five, all right. Next man, how many of you have heard of a man named Nashon? Anybody? Anybody? Okay, a couple of you, just a couple. But the hands did not go up very quickly, all right. Nashon was not one of those guys that is uh, mentioned in the same breath as Moses, Elijah, Abraham, David. You understand what I'm saying? But he is in the Bible. And uh, we're going to see some things. And, you know, here's the whole point of this lesson. There are people in the Bible that God doesn't say a whole lot about them, but it doesn't mean they weren't used of God. Not everybody gets to be the preacher. Not everybody gets to be, you know, a deacon or whatever. But I want everybody here to know that though you may not be in a position where you're in the limelight or you're on the platform, everybody can be used of God. And everybody is vital in the Lord's work. And so we're going to look this morning at this man named, I think I'm saying it right, Nashon. And I want to start in 1 Chronicles chapter 2, verse number 10. The Bible says, And Ram, now how would you like that for a name, guys? Ram begat Aminadab. And Aminadab begat Nashon, prince of the children of Judah. That's the phrase that is not really in here about some of the other people in this genealogy. Now watch this, and Nashon begat Salma, uh, which is also spelt Salmon, S-A-L-M-O-N in other places. And Salmon begat Boaz, and Boaz begat Obed, and Obed begat Jesse. And we know Jesse, uh, his uh, seventh son, was a man named David. All right, so there's the lineage. And so this morning I want to preach a message about this man, Nashon, with this title, Unknown Individuals in the Lineage of Our Lord. Unknown Individuals in the Lineage of Our Lord. And we have to realize that whether we're small, insignificant, or relatively unknown, we can have a huge impact and we can make a difference. There is no insignificant member of the body of Christ. And we understand that. And so we're going to focus on two major themes this morning in the life of this man. We're going to look at number one, where he came from. And we've already read a little bit about that. But number two, what his character was like. So let's bow for prayer and ask the Lord to help us this morning. Father, we pray that as we look through this passage and others in the the Old Testament, New Testament, that we would... Uh, glean some some truth and some help from this man's life though there's not a whole lot said there's enough said that we can make some uh, tremendous application in our Christian lives Lord and we'll be careful to thank you and praise you in Jesus name amen number one let's look at where he came from and there's uh, two thoughts about this first of all he was a son wow yeah I mean I know that sounds you know pretty basic but um I'll guarantee you to uh, Aminadab, uh, Aminadab was his father, and he was Aminadab's son. He was a special person in that daddy's life. I'll never forget. I mean, all five of our boys, each one of them, I was there for the birth, and uh, just a miracle of God. And all of those, all of our children are special, and I guarantee you when Nashon was born to Aminadab, it was no, no different. Uh, he was of the tribe of Judah. And we're going to see that uh, in this text. Notice back at 1 Chronicles 2, verse 3, the sons of Judah. All right, and then it goes down through there. So this is a lineage of the tribe of Judah. Obviously, it had to be that tribe because that's the tribe that Jesus came from. He is called in Revelation the lion of the tribe of Judah. And so uh, he was a son of Amenadab. He was the great, great, great uh, grandfather of David. That's a lot of greats. Uh, so all you guys that are granddaddies, you can say, I'm a great guy, you know, because you're not the father, you're the great or great great. And so he was the great, great, great grandfather of David. And Aminadab was his father. Aminadab's name means my people is generous or noble. Think about David being a king. And uh, uh, you're going to see generosity and nobility in the life of Nashon, his son. So he was a son. Second of all, he had 
a sacred heritage. You said, all right, preacher, sacred heritage. We know that. He's from the tribe of Judah. Uh, how, how much can you pull out of these verses? Well, hold on. Let's, let's look at some other. There's some other people in his family. Usually, uh, these Old Testament characters had siblings, right? And so I want you to turn to Exodus chapter number 6 now. Exodus chapter number 6. Exodus chapter number 6. And we're going to find out something interesting about his sacred heritage and his family. Exodus chapter 6. And let's begin in verse 20. And Amram took him, Jochebed, his father's sister, to wife. See, that sounds weird, preacher. This is Old Testament. Pure gene pool. Things were different back then, okay? And she bare him, Aaron, and Moses. And the years of the life of Amram were 137 years. And the son of Izhar, Korah, and Nepheg, and Zikri, and the sons of Uziel, Mishael and Elzaphan and Zithri. Watch this now. And Aaron took him Elisheba, daughter of Amenadab, sister of Nashon, to wife. And she bare him Nadab and Abihu, Eleazar, and Ithamar. That interesting. So Nashon's sister, Elisheba, was the wife to Aaron, who was the first high priest in the sacrificial system that the Lord gave to Moses on Mount Sinai. And so he had a sister. Now let's turn to Numbers chapter 1. Numbers chapter 1. How many of you have learned something new so far today? Good, 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 good. All right, so he was a son. He had a sacred heritage. And we're looking at he had a sister, Elisha, but now we're going to see number two, he's called a prince of Judah. We read that in our text, but I want you to see this in Numbers chapter 1, verse 7. Of Judah, Nashon, the son of Amenadab. Look at verse 16, and it lists all these heads of these tribes. These were the renowned of the congregation, princes of the tribes of their fathers, Heads of thousands in Israel. Nashon was one of those 12, okay? Uh, we read him about him in Ruth chapter 4, verses 17 through 22, the lineage of Christ, where Ruth is in that lineage, uh, married uh, Boaz. We read about Nashon in Matthew chapter 1, verses 4 and 5. And we also read about Nashon in Luke chapter 3, verses 31 to 33. So he's mentioned in the New Testament in Matthew and Luke. And he's mentioned quite a bit in the Old Testament, just not a lot said about him. But what is said about him is very powerful. And now, this is not Bible. This is okay. We're going to step away from the scripture for a minute. But I heard an old preacher one time talk about, uh, he was talking about the Red Sea crossing. And uh, his name was Dr. D.M. Hardison. He was from the Chesapeake area years ago. And he was talking about the Red Sea crossing. And he was mentioning uh, Moses and, you know, how he held the rod out and the Red Sea parted. But he said that he had studied out in the rabbinical writings, which is not scripture, but it'd be kind of like a history book of, for the Jewish people. In the rabbinical writings, uh, it stated that Nashon was one of the first to set foot across the Red Sea. Now, whether that's true or not, I don't know. I can't be factual on that, but that's in the rabbinical writings for what it's worth. And so certainly where he came from, he came from a noble family. He was a son. He had a sacred heritage. Number two, and this is where we'll spend most of our time this morning, I want us to see what his character was like. You know, a person could come from a great family and have rotten character. You know what I'm saying? You know, there are a lot of people in uh, high places right now that if you were to look at their uh, character resume, it would have a lot of black spots on it, probably more than good deeds. Uh, I'm thankful that uh, we can, you know, if, if, if salvation was based on a scale system, our good outweighs our bad like some religions teach, uh, there'd be no hope for a politician. You know what I'm saying? 
but that's why we can pray for people in high places and know that they can be saved still because it's not based on their works. Uh, but he had great character, and I want us to see that. Uh, number one, I want us to see, and we're going to stay in Numbers chapter one, I want us to see that he was a soldier. And we're going to look at four thoughts about him being a soldier. Now look, not all of us are called to lead, uh, but we are all called to serve. I was just talking with someone this morning, and I won't say names because I don't want to embarrass anybody, um, but uh, Sarah Lynn was telling me, she said, I, I couldn't be you. you know, oh, I'm sorry, I, I mentioned her name. Uh, she was saying, I, I don't know how you do it. Well, I don't know how I do it either. Um, I guess most preachers, if they're honest, would be if, if they were really honest, they'd say, well, we can't do it. God's got to do it through us. And uh, that's the truth of the matter. Because there are some weeks that are just laid back. And you're, you're thinking as a pastor, well, well, why can't every week be like this? <laughs> and then there are weeks where everything happens. And uh, you're pulled and tossed about. And there's late nights and, and so forth. Uh, but the reality is the grace of God allows, uh, and God has to call a man to a position of leadership, uh, but we're all called to serve. Whether you're in this position of leadership or you're down there and in, in serving in another capacity, we're all called to serve, and we need to remember some things. God is looking for some believers who are ready to go to war for the Lord, who is the captain of our salvation. Now look, we read about war in Russia and Ukraine, and we, uh, you know, the Bible said before the second coming there would be wars and rumors of wars. See that you be not soon shaken, for all these things must come to pass. But, you know, there is a war that's taken place that sometimes we really minimize as believers, and that's spiritual warfare. Because we don't see, and it's not tangible in the sense that I can't touch the battle, in the sense of a soldier maybe having hand-to-hand -hand combat with the enemy, there is battles raging right now, and uh, let me tell you a way to, to prove that. Um, when's the last time you, got a, you, did, you had set some time aside and you decided, you know what, I'm really going to spend more than just five minutes with the Lord. I'm going to spend a good bulk of time with the Lord in prayer, maybe 15 minutes, maybe a half an hour, maybe more. And when you got alone and you got away from the noise and you got away from the crowd and you uh, retreated to your place of solitude, wherever that is, and you began to pray, how many of you in that place of solitude when you're trying to pray get distracted? Anybody? <laughs> I'm so glad I'm not by myself there. I mean, all of a sudden you start thinking about things that have to be done when you're trying to pray. Isn't that amazing? You know, uh, if you can't remember something and you're trying to remember where, maybe where you put your keys, start praying. You probably will remember. Because the devil distracts us in those alone times with the Lord. It seems like he, he just, he, if he's fighting over here and he sees that you're over here trying to pray, he says, okay, let's redirect the guns over here. This guy's praying too long. <laughs> and he starts firing. And... Look, the, the reality is there's spiritual wickedness in high places. And when we go into praying, we're engaging on the front lines of the battle. And we don't always think of it in that perspective. But you need to start thinking of it in that perspective. When you go to praying, you're on the front lines and the devil doesn't like it. And he's going to target you. He doesn't want you to pray. You know why? Because prayer works. Prayer moves the heart of God. And so uh, he's a soldier. Let's look at this. Uh, Numbers chapter 1, verse 1, The Lord spake unto Moses in the wilderness of Sinai, in the tabernacle of the congregation, on the first day of the second month, in the second year after they were come out of the land of Egypt, saying, Take ye the sum of all the congregation of the children of Israel after their families, by the house of their fathers, with the number of their names, every male by their poles, from 20 years old and upward, all that are able to go forth, where? To war in Israel. Thou and Aaron shall number them by their armies. And there, and with you there shall be a man of every tribe, every one head of the house of his fathers. And these are the names of the men. And then we see Nashon is mentioned in verse 7. So number one... He was selected because he was able. 
and willing. Hey, can I ask you a question? This is part of our character. When we talk about fighting the good fight of faith, and it is a fight, are you able and willing to fight? Now, we're not talking about this kind of fighting. We're talking about this kind of fighting. And serving the Lord in other ways. Uh, I think a lot of people in, in churches would say they're able, or they're willing and they're able, but how, what good is a soldier that's willing and able that doesn't get in the battle? Yeah, I'll go. I'm willing. Sign me up. All right, we need you. Oh, I can't today. I got a conflict of schedule. You know what I'm saying? When we really want to get serious about this thing called spiritual warfare, everything else should fit around that prayer schedule. It really should. And I know that's difficult. Listen, I'm not up here saying that I've got this great prayer schedule and I'm the, the best prayer warrior in the congregation. I'm not. I'm saying it's difficult. Sometimes you feel like you can't find time to pray. And I'm saying what we need to do is rearrange our mindset and we got to find time to fit every else, everything else in around the prayer time. He was able to go to war. Second thing about this man, according to verse 16, he and these other 11 that made up the 12 heads of the 12 tribes, they were the renowned of the congregation, verse 16 says. They were the renowned of the congregation. This word renowned simply means summoned or called from the congregation. Can I ask you a question? Where will the next generation of missionaries and preachers and preachers' wives come from? I can promise you they're not going to come from the state universities for the most part. You know where they're going to come from? Local churches like this one. Local churches like this one. And if not from our churches, then where will they come from? Now think about it. A family that goes to church and they make church a priority, their children, and I'm not here to do the math and I didn't do any math, Thank the Lord, because it'd probably be wrong. But if, if I did the math, or if you did the math, and you think about it, if you have a child in church, probably not 52 Sundays out of the year, because, you know, account for sickness and those kind of things, vacation, whatever. There's still, if you're faithful, you're still going to have your kids in church 40-some Sundays a year, right? On average. And if you're really faithful, you'll have them on Wednesday night 40-some Sundays a year. Barring sickness and those kind of things. And then you think about the kid that's not raised in a Christian home that never goes to church. Hey, I've got some kids on my baseball team I'm burdened for. <clears throat> Aiden's baseball team. I'm the coach. And, you know, I try to be friendly with parents. I've got a good rapport with parents and all that kind of stuff. I've had parents say, we're thankful our kids are on your team. Uh, blah, 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 and all that good stuff. But I'm burdened for some of those boys because I know they're not here or a place like this. Many of them, some of them do. Some of them have churches. But not like my boys are. You see what I'm saying? And so if we do the odds, what are the odds that a family that goes to church 40-some Sundays out of the year and Wednesday nights versus the family that doesn't go at all? Now, we know God can do miracles and God can still save these young people, and God can still call these. But what are the odds? I would say, wouldn't you, that the odds of God calling young people that grow up in church greater than those that don't? That don't? It would make sense, logically, right? And, and the, the, the foundation, and, I, and I, I reflect back on my own life. I mean, when I went to Bible college, I had a good working knowledge of all the basic Bible stories and those kinds of things, and I'm thankful for that. I learned a lot of Bible memory verses in our Christian school and then when I got to college, it just doubled and tripled. I had to learn a lot more. And so <clears throat> I'm thankful for that upbringing. I'm thankful for that background. But where are they going to come from? Doesn't the scripture say, pray ye the Lord of the harvest, that he would send forth laborers into his harvest? That ought to be a regular prayer request from God's people to pray the Lord of the harvest. So... They were renowned, they were called, they were summoned from the congregation. Thirdly, the Bible says, not only was he able, not only was he renowned, but he was a prince of the tribes, according to verse 16. 
The word prince, that means leader, captain, elevated, lifted up, or elected. And I'm telling you today, we are in desperate need in our local churches of servant leadership. And I'm talking about from the top down. Amen. Servant leadership. You say, what does that mean? Uh, a called leader who leads by example and serves alongside his people. That was one of the problems that, that when you read in the Revelation about the churches in uh, Asia Minor, you see this phrase, the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Okay? God hated the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. This is where the clergy elevated themselves above the people, and it was kind of this mindset, kiss the ring. I'm the preacher. I'm the priest. Uh, you're just the, the pathetic lay people. And it was, this, it was this mindset that was kind of lifted the man up to hero worship. You know, that goes on in churches today, even in, Baptist, even in independent Baptist churches. And it shouldn't. It shouldn't. Uh, he was lifted up and elected, uh, but a servant leader is going to do that kind of leadership that he serves alongside his people. Now, I know that there's the office of the deacon, and the deacon is called to wait tables and to do those service and menial tasks so the preacher can spend more time studying and praying. I get that, and that is a biblical concept, and sometimes uh, preachers don't utilize that. I'm thankful I can got men that I can say, hey, can you check on this, and they'll do it, so I don't have to. But when it comes time to like a work day or something like that, I'm going to be here because I don't want to ask you to do something that I wouldn't do myself. That's just how I'm, I'm wired. I believe it's a part of servant leadership. And this man was a prince of the tribes of his fathers. Um, and I don't believe the leader should ever ask his followers to do something that he wouldn't be willing to do himself. And why would I ask you to plunge a toilet if I'm not willing to do it? And so... I don't believe the Lord will ever entrust us with responsibility until we've first proven Him that we are responsible. Okay? And so He was a prince. Then it says in this same verse that He was a head of thousands in Israel. The word head means first, chief, or tops. Turn to Numbers chapter number 2. Numbers chapter 2, verse 1, And the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron, saying, Every man of the children of Israel shall pitch by his own standard and with the ensign of their father's house. Far off about the tabernacle of the congregation shall they pitch. In other words, wherever the tabernacle is set up, they're to get away from the tabernacle and pitch their tent up. Their, their tribes were to set up around the tabernacle, which was the focal point in the middle. And verse 3 says, And on the east side, toward the rising of the sun, shall they pitch of the standard of the camp of Judah pitch throughout their armies. And Nashon, the son of Abinadab, shall be captain of the children of Judah. And his host, and those that were numbered of them, were threescore, 14,600. That totals 74,600 that were under Nashon's command. Now think about that. 74,600 men answered to Nashon. I would say that's a pretty big responsibility, wouldn't you? And so uh, he was indeed a leader of the Lord. He was a head. He was a prince. He was renowned. He was able. I mean, all these things, when you talk about him as a soldier, I think it points to his character. He was indeed a leader for the Lord. and God is looking for some leaders. You know, one of the saddest verses in the Scripture, and there are several sad verses, like there arose another generation after Joseph who knew not the Lord. That's a sad verse. But Ezekiel 22.30 is another such verse which says, God says, I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy it, but I found none. That's a sad verse. God looked amongst all his people and couldn't find one person to stand in the gap. Isn't that a sad verse? All right, so he was a soldier. Second of all, I want us to see he was a servant. 
And I already touched on servant leadership, but I want you to turn to Numbers chapter 7. Numbers chapter 7. Numbers chapter 7. He was a servant. And what else I want us to see, firstly, about his service is he was, Nashon that is, the first to sacrifice. Verse 1, number 7, it came to pass on the day that Moses had fully set up the tabernacle and had anointed it and sanctified it and all the instruments thereof, both the altar and all the vessels thereof, and had anointed them and sanctified them, that the princes of Israel, here he is, heads of the house of their fathers, who were the princes of the tribes and were over them that were numbered, offered, and they brought their offering before the Lord, six covered wagons and twelve oxen, a wagon for two of the princes and for each one an ox. And they brought them before the tabernacle. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Take it of them that they may be to do the service of the tabernacle of the congregation, and thou shalt give them unto the Levites to every man according to his service. Moses took the wagons and the oxen gave them unto the Levites. Two wagons and four oxen he gave to the sons of Gershon according to their service. And so he's going through the list. Look at verse 10. And the princes offered for dedicating of the altar in the day that it was anointed. Even the princes offered their offering before the altar. And the Lord said unto Moses, They shall offer their offering each prince on his day for the dedicating of the altar. And he that offered his offering the first day was Nashon the son of Amenadab of the tribe of Judah. Now look at this offering. His offering was one silver charger. The weight thereof was 130 shekels. One silver bowl of 70 shekels after the shekel of the sanctuary. Both of them were full of fine flour mingled with oil for a meat offering. One spoon of 10 shekels of gold full of incense. One young bullock, one ram, one lamb of the first year for a burnt offering one kid of the goats for a sin offering, and for a sacrifice of peace offerings, two oxen, five rams, five he goats, five lambs of the first year. This was the offering of Nashon, the son of Amenadab. Quite an extravagant offering. That's a lot of livestock. And I believe we could say that his offering was extravagant and it was exemplary. But you know what? God doesn't ask in the New Testament church age that we bring goats and rams and oxen and uh, you know, gold vessels with fine flour and all that stuff. You know what God wants? He wants you. Amen. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, Romans 12, 1, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Now, th now think about this. We all have fallen as children or as even adults. We've got cut up or, you know, we've got scars is what I'm trying to say. And we could probably find those little white scars on our hand. I've got one right across my wrist. I had, a, I had some kind of cyst in my hand here. and It was a big knot and it got in the way. And I had it cut out and then it came back and I had it cut out a second time. And thankfully it's never come back. But I've got this white line right across my hand. And I remember taking showers with bread bags over my hand so you wouldn't get your, the surgery, you know, the, the wrapping wet and all that good stuff. But, but I, every time I see that, I remember I had two surgeries right there. We all have scars. And uh, God says this offering, they had to find a lamb of the first year, and they had to find these different animals and we know that they were supposed to be inspected and be without blemish, et cetera, et cetera. And we think about Romans 12, 1 and 2. Our bodies are to be a sacrifice that is holy. They went to great lengths to make sure these sacrifices in the Old Testament were just right. Shouldn't we go to the same length in the New Testament and present this sacrifice Holy before the Lord? Absolutely. And so he was the first to sacrifice. Go over to Numbers chapter 10. We talk about him being a servant. Numbers chapter 10. 
Not only was he the first to sacrifice as a servant, but he was the first to move. Verse 1, the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Make thee two trumpets of silver, of a whole piece shalt thou make them, that thou mayest use them for the calling of the assembly. Okay, that was the first purpose. So you blow the trumpet to call the assembly. Number two, and for the journeyings of the camp. So when it's time to move, we blow the trumpet. Time to move, boys. And when they shall blow with them, all the assembly shall assemble themselves to thee at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And if they blow but with one trumpet, then the princes, which are heads of the thousands of Israel, shall gather themselves unto thee. But when you blow an alarm, then the camps that lie on the east part shall go forward. When you blow an alarm the second time, the camps that lie on the south shall take their journey. Then they shall blow an alarm for their journeys. When the congregation is to be gathered together, ye shall blow, but it shall not sound an alarm. And the sons of Aaron, the priests, shall blow with the trumpets. They shall be to you for the ordinance forever throughout your generation. Now, isn't it interesting? Who was to blow the trumpets? The priests. Hey, who's to blow the trumpet and sound out the word of the Lord in the New Testament? The preacher. <laughs> That's all a preacher is, is just to sound the alarm, to warn people, to help people, to shepherd people. And there's, there's different roles and so forth, we understand that. Now watch verse 9, here's the third reason. So to call the assembly, to journey, and, verse 9, if you go to war in your land against the enemy that oppresseth you, then you shall blow an alarm with the trumpets, and you shall be remembered before the Lord your God, and you shall be saved from your enemies. So God doesn't tell us you know, what they did was the alarm... And, 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 you know, to, to just call the assembly, you know, I don't know what the sounds were, but they apparently had something worked out where they knew a distinction of the sounds. It also says in verse 4, a fourth reason. Also, in the day of your gladness and your solemn days, the beginnings of your month, so obviously we're talking about a time of peace, ye shall blow with the trumpets over your burnt offerings and over the sacrifices of your peace offerings, that they may be to you for a memorial before your God. I am the Lord your God. So there was four reasons that they would blow these trumpets, okay? And uh, when you see these things here, it says to go to war, and it says the first would be those on the east. When, when you read through these verses we just read, well, who was on the east? Judah. They were the first to move, whether it be assembly, camp, war, or for worship. The Bible says in verse 12, Israel, the children of Israel took their journeys out of the wilderness of Sinai. The cloud rested in the wilderness of Paran, and they first took their journey according to the commandment of the Lord by the hand of Moses in the first place when the, when the standard of the camp of the children of Judah according to their armies and over his host was Nashon, the son of Amenadab. There he is. Hey, so when God says move, uh, you know what we do sometimes, Lord, are you sure you want me to do that? You know what we ought to say when God says, hey, Lord, it's time for you to jump? We ought to say, Lord, how high? What we, what we do is we, we say, Lord, are you sure? But what we should say is, Lord, how high do you want me to jump? And uh, I understand some of you, that would be physically impossible, but you understand the significance of the illustration. Uh, Nashon, though, was a man of character. When God asks us to move, shouldn't we volunteer Shouldn't we just say, Lord, if, if there's a need and I can meet it, count me in. This is what happens a lot of time. When we, we need something done, this is what we do. Man, I want to volunteer. Surely somebody else could get involved. Oh, I want somebody else to get involved and be a blessing. And we spiritualize an excuse. If there's a need and you can meet it, why not volunteer? That's what they did. They were the first to move. Nashon was a man of character. He was a soldier and he was a servant. He came from a godly family and the Lord Jesus Christ came from his lineage. He was a servant leader. He wasn't first though because he was a big shot or a braggart. His mindset I believe was this, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Numbers 10, chapter 10 and verse 28 says this, Thus were the journeyings of the children of Israel according to their armies when they were set forward. You see that? Now, if he was one of the first to cross the Red Sea, 
he would have known about God commanding Moses in Exodus chapter 14. Remember that story? Moses said, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. God said, go forward. He would have known that story. So the question is, are we moving forward for the Lord or are we in a place of spiritual stagnation? You know what a stagnation is? The, you get fed, but you don't do anything with it. The water comes in, but there's no outlet. God's people need to not only take in the Word of God on a Sunday, on a Wednesday, but we need to live it out. We need to exercise our faith. And I want to close with the reminder that the Apostle Paul gave the Philippian church in chapter 3, verses 13 and 14. He said, Brethren... I count not myself to have apprehended. And that, that old English word simply means, Paul was saying, I've not arrived. Now look, if there's anybody in the, in the ministry, based on his past, what God brought him out of, religion, and made him an apostle of Jesus Christ, he wrote most of the New Testament. If anybody could say, I've arrived, it would be Paul. But Paul said, I've not arrived. I've not arrived. I, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. You know, God has been good to our church, and I could look back and I could tell you stories, and I think we ought to write those things down, and it is kind of a memorial. We remember what God's done in the past. But you cannot have present victories over sin or over temptation, over past victories. Past victories were victories then. Thank God for them. Remember them. But don't live in the past. We need a fresh anointing today. We need fresh marching orders today. We need to press on toward the prize uh, of, the, 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 of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And by the way, it is a high calling. It is a high calling. You don't have to be known in the Lord's army. But are you faithfully serving? Are you making a difference? There wasn't a whole lot said about Nashon. There really wasn't. But there was enough said to challenge us. Here's a guy that didn't receive a lot of accolades, but God said over and over he was a prince, he was a head, he was a man of renown. And we read about him going forth first. Let's be a nashon. Let's not be a person that's seeking to have attention and seeking to have glory, seeking to have uh, accolades or rec uh, being recognized. Let's be that person that just simply does the job whether anybody sees it or not, God sees it. That's all that matters. Unknown individuals in the lineage of our Lord. Father, thank you for our time. I pray you bless the service to follow. In Jesus' name, amen. You are dismissed.
All right, good morning. It is good to see you all this morning. And we're going to start off with our hymnals at 537. 537 is where we're going to start singing today. And as you find, in, you find your place, let's all stand when you're able to. And we're going to sing 537, In My Heart There Rings a Melody. 537. I have a song that Jesus gave me. It was sent from heaven above. There never was a sweeter melody than the melody of love. In my heart there rings a melody. There rings a melody with heaven's harmony. In my heart there rings a melody. through the pianist for a loop. That's my fault. But we're going to sing probably fast the next verse and then on verse 3. We'll slow it down on that chorus. Let's sing verse 2. I love the Christ who died on Calvary for he washed my sins away. He put within my heart a melody and I know it's there to stay. In my heart there rings a melody a melody with heaven's harmony. In my heart there rings a melody, there rings a melody of love. Twill be the endless theme in glory, with the angels I will sing. Twill be a song with glorious harmony, when the chords of heaven You may be seated. Welcome to our Sunday services. We're glad to have this crowd. We've got a few folks traveling out of town. It's good to have Fabi and Ashley back, our newest married couple. They sent me a picture. They thought of me on their honeymoon. They found a place over there in Pigeon Forge called Crazy Mason, some kind of, some kind of milkshake shop. And that's perfect because I love ice cream. And I said, I sent him a text back, and I said, you know, the Mason was from after, named after me. The Crazy was named after my wife. But, uh, probably not true, but probably not true, but anyway, uh, we're glad that you're here, and uh, I was talking to Joy, she's been coming with the Millers, and her neighbor has a 17-year-old son named Derek, and he's uh, been having some kind of heart problem, he had a seizure this morning, and so Joyce asked if we'd pray for her neighbor's son, Derek, and so we're going to lift him up in prayer this morning, and uh, let's pray for a great uh, day in the Lord. And we're excited about the festivities of the day. Brother Ed Crenshaw, would you open us in prayer this morning? Yes. Amen. 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 All right. Okay. Our next song we're going to sing is page 251. 251. And we'll turn a couple pages and sing a chorus. 251. The song is The Lily of the Valley. You can stay seated and uh, turn to that page. 251. I have found a friend in Jesus. He's everything to me. He's the fairest of 10,000 to my soul. The lily of the valley, the prime alone I see. All I need to cleanse and make me fully whole. In sorrow he's my comfort, in trouble he's my stay. He tells me every care on him to roll. He's the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my 
Christ. So good job on that hallelujah, Pastor. Let's get a couple extra men to help him on that second. He all my griefs has taken and all my sorrows borne. In temptation he's my strong and mighty tower. I have all for him forsaken and all my idols torn. With my heart and now he keeps me by his power. Let all the world forsake me and Satan tempt me sore. Then Jesus I shall safely reach the goal. Hallelujah, he's the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. He will never, never leave me, nor yet forsake me here, while I live by faith and do his blessed will. A wall of fire about me, I've nothing now to fear. With his manna he my hungry soul shall fill. Then sweeping up to glory, I'll see his blessed face, of delight shall ever roll. Hallelujah, he's the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He's the fairest of 10,000 to my soul. Great, we're going to turn now 254, just one page further. 254, a great chorus. Every day with Jesus should be sweeter than the day before. Amen. That should be the attitude of a Christian. 254, let's sing this chorus through. Every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. Every day with Jesus, I love him more and more. Jesus saves and keeps me, and he's the one I'm waiting for. Every day with Jesus is sweeter than Let's take our bulletins this morning. And did everybody get a bulletin? We want to make sure everybody gets one. Brother Ed, all right. First of all, before we get to the bulletins, let me read a thank you note. Dear church family and friends, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you all for how you have ministered to our family, even, through, even though we were brand new members. I'd like to thank all those who prepared meals, uh, given love gifts, helped with the funeral and meal, uh, but most importantly, all who prayed. I'm so thankful for all of you and would appreciate prayers as we adjust to our life without Horatio. Thanks again, Susie, Josiah, Paul, and Matthew. And so we want to continue to pray for you guys, and you are in our prayers. Also, uh, got this note from uh, Pat and Becky. Uh, workers needed at the Women's Enrichment Center annual yard sale. And the yard sale is uh, Friday and Saturday, May 13th and 14th at the farmer's market. But they need to move, uh, set up tables and things on Thursday the 12th and move some things there. Uh, if any could give a half a day uh, to help set up on Thursday or to, ha to haul goods to the sale if you have a truck or to make uh, you know, sales on Friday and Saturday, uh, please see Pat or Becky today today so that's may 12 13 and 14 if you're available uh, thank you for helping us serve others through the work of the women's enrichment center uh, also uh, today right after the morning service uh, for those of you who have signed up and you say well i didn't know about it well we might have enough but we, we i think we made enough for those who signed up for the meal just make your way to the fellowship halls and, and find a seat there's no, there's no going down the hall and going through the line. They're gonna, you're going to be served by the teenagers that are going to camp. And so this meal is a donation basis. So well, I wasn't prepared to stay and eat. You can still make a donation today only, though. Okay? Uh, actually, not today only. But there will be a bucket out there, and so we'd appreciate your help. This is going to help send the kids to Teen Extreme Camp in Pensacola, Florida. Uh, and then Notes of Spring is our annual piano recital that Miss Nikki puts on. On the 7th of May, that's this Saturday, at 10 a.m., there's a sign-up sheet in the vestibule. And so the, the importance of getting on that is so we can make sure that there is a, uh, enough food because there is a lunch following that service or th that, that recital. Also, 
next Sunday is Mother's Day, and we're going to be honoring our mothers, but I, I want to encourage you to be here for Sunday school and the evening service because missionary Edgar Fagali will be with us. He's a veteran missionary to uh, the Middle East, and he is a native Lebanese. He also has American citizenship, and he travels uh, all around the Middle East. Uh, you know, did you know there's a Baptist church in Baghdad? Did you know that? Independent Baptist church. And so there are things, good things happening all across the world that we don't, you're not going to get on Fox News even, okay? And so uh, I hope you'll be here for that. I'll be preaching the morning service, and so he'll be preaching in the night and in Sunday school. On the 15th, we have a baptism after the morning service. I think we have about five to baptize. And then uh, don't forget, uh, today's the last day. I, we kind of dropped the ball on this. We give... Uh, a scholarship. It's called the Kolb Kennedy Memorial Missionary Scholarship in memory of Paul Kennedy and Larry Kolb. Um, and it goes to a young person at Ambassador Baptist College that is going to do a missionary internship, which is required. And the church budgets $1,000 out of our missions fund. And then we asked if anybody would like to give toward that, we'll add to it. And today is the deadline for that. Uh, and so if you would help us out with that. Or if you let us know, hey, I'm not prepared to give today, but I'm going to give next Sunday. We just have to get a check to the school this week. And so if you can't give today, you can give next week. Just let us know. Let Jamie or Brenda know or myself. Um, and today is a special day. It's Brother Jim Clark's birthday. And he turned 50 years old today. Amen. And so uh, we're going to sing happy birthday to Brother Clark. Also, Travis. Uh, Travis turns 25 on the 3rd, okay? So let's sing happy birthday to these two today. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. And many, many more. And I've got a son that's going to be 10 years old next Saturday. And where has time gone? Good night. I can't believe it. I told him he's got to quit growing, quit getting so big. Our missionary spotlight this week is the Miyashita family, our missionaries to Japan. I hope you'll keep them in your prayers. But let's say our memory verse of the month found in Matthew chapter 5 together this morning. Matthew 5, 16. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Matthew 5, 16. All right, today is our also children's change offering. So ushers, men, we're going to ask you to come first. And then when the offering is taken, we're going to get down uh, and let the kids bring their change offering. All right, so you be prepared. Ushers, if you'll come on. All right, Brother Dennis, would you pray and ask the Lord to bless these tithes and missionary offerings this morning? Your Honor, Father and God, thank you, Lord, for the day given. Thank you, Lord, for the privilege of being here in this, Amen. In this church and in this worship service. We pray, God, at this time to take this offering to be used for your honor and glory, to your blessing. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
Lang Livia. All right, let's take our Bibles and turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and we'll sing a song after this as well. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and when you find your place, please stand out of respect for the reading of God's Word. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. First Thessalonians chapter 5, we'll be reading verse 20, 21, and 22. It says in verse 20, Despise not prophesyings. Prove all things, hold fast that which is good, abstain from all appearance of evil. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Now we're going to take our hymnals and turn to 387. 387. I'll give you a little bit to turn and find your place there. 387, Because He Lives, and we'll stay standing for this song, and we'll sing all three verses, 387.
wonderful song, You May Be Seated. All right, Junior Church, you're dismissed as we turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Junior Church is dismissed. Well, we are continuing our journey through the book of 1 Thessalonians, our theme for the year, Be the Example. By the way, for some of our visitors who may not know, we do a change offering with these kids the first Sunday of every month, and everything that comes in that children's change offering goes to give a Christmas present to all of our missionary children that are scattered throughout the world. And I think last year we gave each child $30, something like that, per, per kid, so that's a blessing. And it also is designed to teach our kids the joy of giving. And so we're thankful for that. And so we're looking at uh, some straightforward exhortations that the Apostle Paul is giving this church to close out the book. And, you know, we all want to walk victoriously. And one of the ways we do that is to be transparent. And if you are obeying these straightforward exhortations, there will be a transparency. For example, if you're, you know, if you're rejoicing evermore, it's going to be obvious. It's going to be obvious that you're, you have the joy of the Lord. If you're praying, it's going to be obvious because you're going to get some answers to prayer. If you're giving thanks and you're a thankful person, that, that's going to come out. You can't just be thankful privately. It's going to come out. And so we, we talked about quenching the spirit, kind of like putting a wet blanket on a fire. Today we're going to look at verses 21 and 22. 20 and 21, we may get to 22. I had Kevin read it. We'll see about that. But I want to preach a message to you entitled this morning simply, Truth and Proof. Truth and Proof. The scripture says, despise not prophesying, prove all things, hold fast to that which is good. Let's bow for prayer and ask the Lord to help us this morning. Father, thank you for your word. And though these are very short uh, verses of scripture, Lord, we know that they are packed with dynamic truth, life-changing truth, if we'll make application. And Lord, my prayer this morning is that every person that's within the sound of my voice uh, would be truthful and honest with themselves, and Lord, that they would be teachable uh, in the things of God. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> the scripture says, despise not prophesying. Now, we use this word despise in a, you know, sometimes flippantly. Uh, I don't hate anybody, uh, but when Tom Brady was the quarterback for the New England Patriots, I used this word, I, I despise Tom Brady, because I was tired of the Patriots, I, I despise the Patriots, I don't, I don't dislike the guy, matter of fact, he's a lot, whole lot better a guy now that he's with Tampa Bay, but I still despise the Patriots, you know what I'm saying? Uh, and so we use that terminology, I despise that, and it's just something that's, uh, we just don't like it. God says we're not to have that attitude when it comes to the Word of God. The word despise literally means these two things, contemptible or least esteemed. You don't think, you don't think much of it. Uh, if you despise something, you're not going to wear a t-shirt with that team on it. it. It's least esteemed. It might be the thing you would use to start a fire, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> it's the least esteemed. It's contemptible. And now when we talk about prophesying, I want to define what we're, what we're talking about. Prophecy, um, a lot of people are, ooh, we want to hear messages on prophecy. Because prophecy is future things, future events. It's uh, when a prophet would foretell the future and it came to pass. Jesus' birth was foretold. His second coming has been foretold. And hundreds of prophecies throughout the, the minor and major prophets were fulfilled when Jesus came the first time as a baby. You understand? I mean, he was born of a virgin. Isaiah prophesied that. He would be born in Bethlehem. Micah prophesied that. These prophecies were a prophet, God giving them revelation. They could look down the corridor of time and say, this is what's going to happen. Now, look. Looking down the future road and making prophecy, that, has ce that gift has ceased. When did it cease? Well, just real quick, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. I'll show you when it ceased. So when a preacher or a man comes along and says, God told me that we need to do such and such, and you can't give a chapter or a verse, 
don't believe him. Or in today's world, don't believe her. Though the her is not qualified to be a preacher, okay? Because to be a preacher, you have to be the husband of one wife. <laughs> Hard to be a husband of one wife. And of course, they're trying to redefine that too. But anyway, uh, so notice what it says here. It says in verse 8 of 1 Corinthians chapter 13, Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. doesn't mean they're going to like not come true. It means they're going to stop happening. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. When is that going to happen? Verse 10, when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. Now, those of us that would like for us to believe that speaking in tongues, which is not a gibberish, by the way, it's speaking in another language that you've never studied, uh, they would like us to believe that tongues is still in existence today, and so would prophecies. The problem with that is, then who are you going to believe? Because anybody could come down the pike and say, well, God told me to do this. I've heard of preachers saying, God told me to take an offering. Well, I mean, I believe in taking an offering, but... God didn't tell me to take an offering so I could go buy a new car. You know what I'm saying? And, and there's preachers that, that hoodoo people into giving money that, that God never said anything. So what is that? The question then is, this stuff's going to cease. It's going to vanish. It's going to fail. When is that going to happen when that which is perfect has come? Now, they like to tell us that that which is perfect is talking about Jesus Christ. Though he is perfect, i got news for you. Jesus is not a that. He's a he. The Bible, on the other hand, is that which is perfect, okay? It, it is it, without error. It is incapable of error. It is absolute authoritative truth, all right? And so when that which is perfect has come, was the Bible still being written when Paul wrote this to the Corinthian church? Yes, it was. Uh, matter of fact, it was written in the late 50s A.D. in the first century. John wrote the Revelation, it's estimated, in 95 A.D. So we're talking about a 50-year span where Scripture is still being written by the apostles. And they needed these sign gifts and these miracles to validate their authority. But now that the Scripture's complete, we don't need those gifts. And prophecy is one of those gifts. Now... If we mean by prophecy, forth telling what's already written in the book, that's fine. Okay, we're all, we're all for that kind of uh, preaching when we tell what the Bible already says and we preach what it, it says. Uh, I'm going to try to forth tell and explain this passage to you this morning. But as far as a preacher getting up saying, well, this is going to happen. You know, uh, I heard there was a book, I didn't really think much about it, is it? 14 year old kid in 1988 but they they say there's a guy that wrote a book called 88 reasons why jesus is coming back in 1988 you can probably get it for a nickel at a thrift store all right it didn't happen no man knoweth the day of the hour and so these guys that want to get up there and say i got a prophetic word oh i'm feeling it i'm feeling the lord speaking to me and he's telling me that you need to do such and such you need to sell your house. You need to buy this car. Or you don't need to buy this car. Because God told me. That's a bunch of hogwash. Amen. And any preacher that says that that's God telling him is uh, full of baloney. Because this prophecies have ceased with the completion of the New Testament. You understand that? So I want to make sure we understand. So what we're talking about here, when we make application, though it could have meant at the time it was written, despise not prophetic utterances because they've ceased how then do we apply this scripture despise not prophet well let me ask you this when isaiah said a virgin shall conceive and he gave that prophecy was that the word of god yes or no yes because it's written it's recorded thus saith the lord so though we are not giving any further revelation god is not giving out any more new revelation okay what has been revealed to us in this 66 books, the canon of Scripture, what has been revealed to us, we are not to despise this. This is the Word of God, and it contains prophecy. Okay? So we're not to despise. We're not to look at the Bible as contemptible. 
We're not to look at the Word of God as lightly esteemed or least esteemed. Okay? So we're not to despise what has already been written in the Scripture. I want to give you two illustrations. And then we're going to give you three thoughts about despise, not prophesize. 2 Chronicles chapter 16, if you'll turn there. 2 Chronicles chapter 16. We're going to look at two different kings in the Old Testament that despised the prophet of God and his prophecy that they gave. The first was King Asa. Now, in chapter 14, Asa's got a problem with uh, Zerah the Ethiopian, and uh, it was a pretty big problem. If you look at verse 8 of 2 Chronicles chapter 14, I want you to turn there because this is significant. I don't want you to take my word for it. I want you to see what God says about it. 2 Chronicles chapter 14, Asa, in verse 8, had an army of men that bear targets and spears out of Judah, 300,000. That's a pretty good crowd. Uh, and out of Benjamin that bear shields and drew bows, 204 scores thousand. So that's 280,000. All these were mighty men of valor. So we got 580,000 people in his army. 280,000 Benjamites. Uh, and 300,000 from the tribe of Judah. Are you with me? 580,000. Verse 9, And there came out against them Zerah the Ethiopian with a host of 1,000,000, and 300 chariots came unto Meresha. Now, somebody, I'm not that good at math. Somebody verify this. Multiply 1,000 times 1,000. What's the answer? Good, I wrote that right. 1 million. So let's do the math. 1 million Minus 580,000. 420,000 outnumbered. Nearly two to one. That's a significant problem on a battlefield. Would you agree with me? Amen. Now look what Asa did. Verse number 11. This is what we're supposed to do. Asa cried unto the Lord, his God, and said, Lord, it's nothing with thee to help. Man, he's got some good faith. He's got more faith than I'd have probably had. Whether with many or with them that have no power, help us, O Lord our God, for we rest on thee. I see a little baby back there resting on mama. I see children, most of the time my preaching puts them asleep and they rest on mom or dad's shoulder, right? And they, they're just, they're trusting, or if you're in the ba babies in your arms, they're relying, they're resting on you to hold them up. You're not going to drop them. That's what that word means. God, he says, God, we rest or we depend on thee. And in thy name we go against this multitude. O Lord, thou art our God, let no man prevail against thee. And the Bible says the Ethiopians were overthrown in the middle of verse 13 that they could not recover themselves for they were destroyed before the Lord and before his host. And they carried away very much spoil. Hey, you got a million man army? They're going to leave a lot of goodies behind. And they carried that spoil away. Almost outnumbered two to one. And this King Asa had faith in God. He said, God, we're just going to depend on you. Well, some years pass, we come to chapter 16, and there's another problem. Baasha, king of Israel, now has come up against Judah. And the Bible says, uh, to the intent that he might let none go out or come into Asa, king of Judah. And we don't know what the, the, the difference is. I don't think it was a million versus 580,000. It was probably, you know, closer odds, but... The Bible says, Asa, verse 2, brought out silver and gold out of the treasures of the house of the Lord of the king's house and sent to Ben-Hadad, king of Assyria, that dwelt at Damascus, saying, there's a league between me and thee. In other words, he's, he's now sending some, some goodies from the treasure house of God to the enemy of God, saying, let's make a league here, because the king of Israel's come against me. And the king of Israel didn't even have half the army of the Ethiopian era. And the Bible says that, verse 7, at that time. So let me ask you a question. Who did he rely on against Zerah, the Ethiopian? Who, who, did, who did Asa rely on or rest on against the Ethiopians? God. Who's he relying on against Basha? The arm of the flesh. <laughs> Syria, yeah. All right, now watch this. And at that time, verse 7, Hanani, the seer. The word seer means prophet came unto Asa king of Judah and said unto him, Because thou hast relied 
on the king of Syria and not relied on the Lord thy God. It's the same word as translated rest in chapter 14, verse 11. Therefore the host of the king of Syria escaped out of thine hand. We're not the, and he reminds him, were not the Ethiopians and the Lubbams a huge host and with very many chariots and horsemen, yet because thou didst rely on the Lord, he delivered them into thine hand? In other words, you relied on the Lord then, why didn't you rely on him now? But you know, we're like that. We rely on the Lord over here in our past and we get into a present predicament and we fail to rely on the Lord like we used to. We, we, we rationalize and we say, you know what, i got to figure this thing out. And that's why this verse, I love this verse, it's in this context. The eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in the behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. In other words, he's saying, Asa, God is looking for a man that will trust him. He is looking, his eyes are running all over the face of the earth to look for a man whose heart is perfect, that's trusting in the Lord, and God's going to help that person. He said, you did it back there, why didn't you do it now? Look at verse 10. And Asa was wroth or angry with the seer and put him in a prison house for he was in a rage with him because of this thing. You know why? He didn't want him telling him what God said. And Asa oppressed some of the people at the same time. You know what? I believe with all my heart he oppressed the people because he wasn't right with the Lord. He wasn't in his right thinking. And Asa in his 30 and 9th year. Now that was in the 30 and 6th year when this whole story started in chapter 16 with Basha. Three years have transpired. He's now in the 39th year of his reign. And the Bible says he was diseased in his feet until the disease was exceeding great. Yet in his disease... He sought not to the Lord, but to the physicians. Still relying on the arm of the flesh. Not like he relied on the Lord many years ago. And isn't it interesting when this king took his feet out of the path that God wanted him to walk and started walking on a different path out of the will of God, God said, all right, big boy. You're going to walk in the path that I didn't instruct you to walk in. I'm going to put a disease in your feet. I don't believe that's a coinky dink. I believe that God did that to try to send a message to this man that you used to rely on God, but you have forsaken the prophet of God and you have forsaken the word of God. Look, at, look with me in 1 Kings chapter 18. Go back uh, two books, 1 Kings chapter 18. Here's a more well-known prophet than Hanani. His name is Elijah the prophet. Elijah the prophet. And he comes on the scene in chapter number 17. And Elijah the Tishbite. That's how he's introduced. Like he's you know, been around a while and he, he was. But that's how he's introduced. And he pronounced that drought when King Ahab was that wicked king who married Jezebel. Was in power of Israel. And Elijah pronounced that there would not be uh, rain until he said so. And we come over to chapter 18, verse 1. It came to pass after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, Go show thyself to Ahab, and I will send rain upon the earth. Elijah went to show himself unto Ahab, and there was a sore famine in Samaria. Drop down, if you would, to verse 17. They finally meet up, Elisha and Ahab, Elijah and Ahab. The Bible says, and it came to pass when Ahab saw Elijah, and who is Elijah? The prophet that says, thus saith the Lord. He, he's given truth to the people of God, the king of what God revealed to him, and, and he, he meets him here, and Ahab says, get this, listen to this guy, art thou he that troubleth Israel? Isn't it ironic that the people that want to complain against God, they always complain about it's always God's fault. But when, they, uh, you know, when things are going good, God never gets the glory. But when things are going bad, it's always God's fault. You're that man of God that's troubling Israel. And he answered, I have not troubled Israel. But thou and thy father's house 
here's how you've troubled Israel. He's going to give him the reason. It's what the liberals will just say, you're the problem. They won't tell you why you're the problem. The real problem is they don't want God in the solution or in the equation. But truth says you're the problem and here's why. You know why? Because truth is transparent. Watch this. In that, you're the problem, in that, verse 18, ye have, here it is, forsaken the commandments of the Lord, and thou hast followed Balaam, who was a false prophet. Hey, why does the devil have false prophets? Because he knows they work and people are easily deceived by false prophets. Charlatans. And... This king, Ahab, was just like Asa. He despised the word of God. And here's the first thought. There's the two illustrations. So here's how we despise prophesying. I'm going to give you these three thoughts, how we despise prophesying. Number one, we despise God's word when we forsake his commandments. We despise God's word. We least esteem truth when we forsake it. See, is it possible for Christians to forsake truth? We just read at least one of them. I believe Asa will be in heaven. I don't know about Ahab, but we, we know Asa is, uh, was a man of God for a while there. And, and, and so it's possible, yes. And folks, the reality is we cannot pick and choose which scriptures to apply and then reject or ignore the other scriptures. I want you to turn to Deuteronomy chapter 32. Deuteronomy chapter 32. This really kind of sums all up what I'm trying to say here in this first point because it, it ties us together with this story. This is the song of Moses, and he's re rehearsing some things uh, of Israel's past and what God's going to do and so forth. And he talks about an individual named Jeshurun. <clears throat> And the Bible says in Deuteronomy 32, 15, But Jeshurun waxed fat and kicked. Thou art waxen fat, thou art grown thick, thou art covered with fatness. Now, it's not talking about pounds, folks. It's talking about blessings. All right? Now, watch what happened. Then, after he waxed fat, after he got blessed, then he forsook God which made him, and lightly, there it is, esteemed. In other words, he despised the rock of his salvation. They provoked him to jealousy with strange gods, with abominations provoked they him to anger. Now, isn't it interesting? You mark it down when an individual decides, I'm going to forsake truth. I'm going to deviate away from the word of God. I'm going to walk in a different path than what God's word says inevitably what follows after that decision to forsake God and his word is idolatry and wickedness look at it they provoked God to jealousy with strange gods they provoked him to anger look at verse 17 they sacrificed unto devils not to God to God's little g whom they knew not why would you why would you sacrifice or worship a God, little g, that you don't even know? That doesn't make any sense. But you know what? When people are out of God's will, you're not going to make sense. Your life won't make sense. Your decisions won't make sense. You're going to spin in a vicious cycle of oblivion and, and spinning your wheels with life, no purpose, no desires, no dreams, no goals, because you're just spinning your wheels in sin. To gods whom they knew not, to, to new gods that came newly up, whom your fathers feared not. So, and this is what the world does. Hey, we need a new God for this problem. Let's invent a new God. You know, false religions that are, you know, they have many gods like Hindus. They'll come up with new gods for the problem they have at the time. Well, maybe, maybe we need to come up with a new God to solve this problem of body odor. I don't know, the God of B.O. I don't know. I mean, what, it's crazy. They, they come up with new gods. Oh, hey, hey uh, we, we got rain today. We, we, need, we need to stop raining. It's been raining too much. Let's, let's, let's come up with a new God, the God of drought. 
I mean, it, this is what people who are out of God's will do. And he says, of the rock that begat thee, thou art what? What's it say? Unmindful. He's not even in our thoughts. And has forgotten God that formed thee. So number one, we despise God's word, we despise truth when we forsake God's commands. Number two, we lightly esteem or despise God's word when we forget God's word. It's one thing to forsake it. You say, is it possible, preacher, to forget something you've heard? Yes, it says right there that they were unmindful and forgot God. Now I want to show you another place, 2 Peter chapter 1. Turn in the New Testament, 2 Peter chapter 1. This is written to Christians, by the way, this, this part in 2 Peter. Hebrews, James, 1 Peter, chapter number 1. Or excuse me, 2 Peter chapter number 1. 2 Peter chapter number 1. And so he's writing, while you're finding it, verse 1, to them that have obtained like precious faith. So he's writing to Christians. He's not writing to unsaved people. He's writing to born-again Christians. Uh, he says, grace and peace be multiplied to you, verse 2. He says, according to God's divine power, he says, God has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. Isn't that a blessing? That's good to be reminded of, that God Almighty has given His children everything that pertains to life and godliness, how to live the Christian life. God's not playing hide-and-go-seek with, with truth or with how to live and how to live victoriously. He says he's given unto us in verse 4, exceeding great and precious promises. And one of those, by these, you might be partakers of the divine nature. And then he begins this in chapter 1, verse 5. Beside this, beside all of God's blessings, besides salvation, besides grace and peace, besides all things that pertain to life and godliness, we're to give all diligence, add to your faith. And then he goes through a list. We're to add virtue. We're to add to virtue knowledge, to knowledge temperance, to temperance patience, to patience godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness, to brotherly kindness charity. Seven things we're to add to our faith. We ought to be growing in our charity, our love for one another. We ought to grow in brotherly kindness. We ought to grow in patience and temperance, which is self-control and virtue and knowledge. We ought to be growing in these things. Doesn't Peter say, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior? Yes, he said that. Matter of fact, he said that uh, in his epistles here. Now watch this. What happens if you're not adding to your faith? Isn't that a good question? Well, he answers that. He says in verse 9, but, well, let's go back to verse 8. If these things that you're adding be in you and abound, they make you. These things that you're adding to your faith, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't that awesome? But, contrast, if you're adding these things to your faith, you're going to be fruitful. You're not going to be barren. You're going to abound. Okay, but if not, but he that lacketh these things, these seven things, is blind and cannot see you far off and hath what? Forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore, the rather brethren give diligence to make your calling and election sure, for if you do these things, you shall never fail. Or fall, excuse me. And so it is possible for God's people, we can't lose our salvation, but it is possible to forget because you have gone off of the path that God wanted you to stay on. You've deviated and you're unmindful, Deuteronomy 32, you're unmindful and you've forgotten God. You're not even factoring God into life's equations. And this is the great uh, a challenge that we tell young people. When you make decisions in life, when you choose who you're going to marry, when you choose where you're, what you're to do with your life, you have to put God in the midst of that equation and say, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? What wilt thou have me to do? 
Do you know, I heard a preacher say this one time, an evangelist, I love this statement. God never taught men how to make a living. He taught us how to live. Isn't that good? You'll never find uh, A, B, C, one, two, three, follow this formula and you'll be wealthy. But you will find you ought to do this, this, and this and live for God and let God bless you. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, Matthew 6, and all these things shall be added unto you. That's called living the faith life. By the way, I would rather trust in a God that doesn't fail and has never made a mistake than in a person and in a system like the stock market or whatever that can fail and people do make mistakes, wouldn't you? God's economy is way different than man's economy. And so we forget God's word. How do we forget God's word? We don't read it. We don't study it. We don't go to church, et cetera, et cetera. We don't pray. And then people say, I just don't understand why God's not blessing me. I just don't understand. I'm trying to live right. I, I'm, I'm trying. I'm trying. Quit trying and start doing. Just do what God says. Just live the Christian life by faith. Trust Him. You're not going to understand everything the Bible says. I don't know a man that does. And I've been preaching this book a long time. I still don't have it all figured out. But I'm going to tell you what. When it comes down to making a decision whether it's what is rational and what is the book says, you better side with the book every time. It don't have to make sense. It just has to be followed. And so, so many people forget God's word. They don't read it. They don't study it. And so one of the first questions when we say, God, where are you? What is going on with my life? Uh, Lord, obviously, if you're praying to God, you've not totally forgotten him. But maybe you have had some struggles the first question I would ask the person that come to me and says, what do I do? I would ask them this, are you reading your Bible? It's not rocket science. Are you reading your Bible? Are you studying God's Word? Are you memorizing God's Word? And so we despise prophesying when we forsake God's commands, when we forget God's commands. Number three, we despise or lightly esteem God's word when we are flippant with God's word. This means a casual approach. We'll take it maybe one day, but maybe not the next day. Or, here it is, we'll use God's word when it suits us, but we'll neglect God's word when a crisis comes in or when something maybe disagrees with what we want to do. Here's a good one. Well, preacher... <clears throat> That's your opinion. You've heard people say that. <laughs> this is really not my opinion at all. This is uh, absolute truth. Um, well, preacher, that's your interpretation. I don't know how to interpret despise not prophesying other than what I'm preaching right now. It means don't, you know, take God's word and lightly or least esteem it. There's no other interpretation. Despising God's word is putting it on the back burner and it's not first place. Uh, rejoice evermore in everything give thanks. There's no other way to preach that but what it says in everything give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Here's one, here's one. Well Matthew 7, 1 preacher says judge not. Check. Spiritual, I, I meant, and that's probably the one verse most carnal Christians memorize more than any other. Judge not. Don't judge me. Well, I got one for you. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter number 2. You'll like this one. You'll like this one. Matthew 7, 1, probably the most quoted verse by a carnal Christian ever. Judge not, lest ye be judged. Judge not, preacher. It doesn't say don't judge. It says judge not, lest ye be judged. Just remember, when you judge you're going to be judged as well. It's not, a, it's not a condemnation for judging. And I'm going to show you that actually God's people are to judge. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, Paul mentions three kinds of people. He mentions the natural man, he mentions the carnal man, and then the spiritual man. Two of the three are saved people. One of the three are not saved. The natural man is the unsaved man. Now look what he says about them. He says, verse 10, God hath revealed things unto us 
these things that he's not, you know, verse 9, you have to read that, by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the Spirit of man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit of which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us. Which things also we speak, not the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with what? Carnal things? There's no comparison. You compare spiritual with spiritual. You put all the Bible together to figure some things out. But the natural man, the unsaved man, receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. He doesn't want to talk about the Bible. He doesn't want any interest in spiritual things. Why? Because they are foolishness unto him. They're foolishness unto him. Ah, it's just a bunch of stories. That's just a bunch of fairy tales. That's just a bunch of religion to make you feel good, to have some kind of crutch to lean on to. But that's the answer for a natural man, an unsaved man, because spiritual things are foolishness to him. Now watch this. Neither can he know them. An unsaved man can't know truth. Now he can know two plus two is four. He can know that the trees are green and the sky is blue and the clouds are white. We're not talking about that. We're talking about spiritual knowledge. And and an unsaved man that has a little bit of spiritual knowledge will twist it. Even the devil took some scripture and twisted it. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned, spiritually ignorant. But, contrast to the natural man, the unsaved man, but he that is spiritual judgeth all things. Yet he himself is judged of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? The answer is nobody. He's all knowing. But we have the mind of Christ. That's a key phrase. So what is he saying? We're to judge all things because we have the mind of Christ. In other words, when I say, Thou shalt not commit adultery. And if I say, if you're committing adultery, you're in sin. Preacher, you're judging me. No, no, no. I'm just telling you what the judge has already said. You understand? I'm not judging you. I'm just telling you what the judge has. Because you're not going to give an account to me. You'll never stand at the court of Tim Mason. And I'll say, okay, that's you know, 30 shillings. Or that's you know, three years in prison. You're not going to answer to me. You will answer to him. Amen. And you better be thankful for a uh, watchman, a trumpeter, who will sound forth the word of God and warn you about imminent judgment. Ye that are spiritual, he that is spiritual judgeth all things. You know what that means? I've got to judge my own life too. Doesn't Paul tell the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 11, when it's talking about people taking the Lord's Supper unworthily and dying or being sick because they're taking of it unworthily? He says, judge yourself. I don't want to misquote that, but it's right there in 1 Corinthians 11. He says, um, uh, examine himself. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty-eight. 28, let a man examine himself. Verse 31, if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged by him. So, yes, judgment is crucial, not only uh, to help other people know the truth, I have to judge myself i got to examine my own life. And if I'm falling short, I've got to get right with God, just like you have to get right with God. The preacher's not exempt. By the way, there are some things that the Scripture says that God doesn't get always in the specifics. We do know that, like in Galatians, he tells us what the the things of of the flesh are. And he tells us the fruit of the Spirit He says the works of the flesh are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, which is unbridled lust, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, which is a defiant attitude, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. So he does specifically name sin. But there are verses where it doesn't specifically name things. But people don't want to pay attention to these verses. For example, 
1 John chapter 2, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, are not of the Father, but of this world. And the world passeth away in the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Okay, so what does it mean, preacher, love not the world? Does that mean you can't love a car? That's, all, that's part of the world. We're not talking about tangible things that are, not, that are not in and of themselves sinful. All right. Now, I do believe in the Greek, love not the world. There is a word that's translated world as Chevrolet. You know, that might be part of the world. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, but when we talk about the world, we're not talking about tangible objects that are not sinless in and of themselves. We're talking about the world system that promotes fornication and adultery and wickedness and immodesty and etc cetera, etc cetera. you see you see what i'm saying the world system matter of fact james takes it a step further in james chapter 4 and says friendship with the world is enmity against god but see a lot of times people don't want to take that verse that's kind of vague in the sense of it doesn't define what friendship with the world means specifically we want to excuse our sin well the bible doesn't really say specifically so I don't think I'm being a friend of the world if I participate in this activity. Well, listen, you're not going to give an account to me, and you don't have to convince me one way or the other, but you better examine it to the Word of God to make sure what you're doing is, is, is okay. I do know this. When you get saved, your body becomes the temple of God, the temple of the Holy Ghost who lives in us. And a carnal Christian or an unbeliever will make all kinds of excuses. But listen to me, a saved or a spiritual man will not. I didn't get nearly as far as I thought I'd get. I'm going to stop right there because the second part, despise not prophesying, is just one aspect. Because the next verse says, prove all things and hold fast to that which is good. So next week I want to explore what does that mean to prove all things. But let me ask you this in closing. If you'd bow your heads and close your eyes. Do you despise the word of God? Say, oh no preacher, I've got a Bible right on my coffee table at home. I don't despise the word of God. Well, are you flipping about spiritual things? Are you? Have you forsaken... God's commandments have you forgotten some things because you just don't read your Bible or the Bible is just not the priority in life I, I listen I'm not here to judge you I'm just here to preach the Bible the Lord's got to do the judging and the Lord is the one that does the convicting by the way folks let me ask you a question you think about right now your favorite hobby I would assume that most of us, a thought came into our mind just now when I said your favorite hobby, or maybe hobbies. It probably wasn't something sinful. But we've all got hobbies we like to do. I was just getting my hair cut the other day, and the lady that cuts my hair, she had a bunch of big fish on her wall. I mean some big fish. And she probably, somebody paid some money to get those fish mounted. But you know what? When we go to heaven, you'll never see those fish on the wall. I'm not saying don't get your fish mounted. Okay? <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. But what I'm trying to get you to understand is will that matter versus how you are at home? Are you a good daddy? Are you a good mommy? Are you a good grandma? Are you a good grandpa? Are you a good kids? Are you good kids to your parents? See, we're going to give an account for all that one day. That's going to matter. Nothing wrong with the fish, but that's not going to matter. What will matter is these, the things that God's Word tells us. Do you despise what God's Word says? Here's the thing. People say, the reason people despise God's Word is they don't want God's Word putting stipulations on how they want to live their life. And that's, but look, let's think in light of eternity here. Eternity matters, folks. And the things that I've preached today will matter. 
I just, real quick, how many would say, preacher, pray for me. God spoke to my heart specifically today. Would you pray for me? Just slip it up, slip it right up. Thank you. I see those hands. Any others? Thank you. I don't want to despise God's word. I've never, I've not intended to, but I see now that if I just forsake God or forget to do my devotions, it's in essence, I'm putting, I'm, I'm esteeming God's word very low and I need to esteem it very high. Would there be someone here who said, preacher, pray for me. I'm not sure I'm saved. I'm just not sure if I were to die, I'd go to heaven. Can I pray for you? I'm not going to embarrass anyone. just want to pray for you. Anybody like that? Preacher, pray for me. I'm not sure I'm going to heaven. I'd like for you to pray for me. Lord, you've seen the hands. You know the hearts of every person. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to be a people that loves your word and does not despise it. Would you bless in the invitation in Jesus' name. Let's all stand. 385. 385. If you'll turn in your hymn books, sing with me on the first, trust and obey. When we walk with the Lord in the light of His Word, what a glory He sheds. All right, stand on this second step. Noah got saved in my office what, three or four weeks ago. And he came up to me last week and said, can I get baptized? And so we met in the office again. And he, he very clearly uh, remembers asking Jesus to save him and that he believes in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ to save his soul. So Noah wants to get baptized. And we're going to have a baptism in two weeks. So all in favor of receiving Noah and our church, say amen. 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 All right, buddy. You can step down. You can go back to your seat. Actually, stay right here because we're going to shake hands with you. You get to shake hands with everybody in here. Isn't that cool? Also, Ralph and Linda Copeland have come. And uh, the Lord put us together last year. They started coming and his ministry at the campgrounds. Uh, Amazing Grace Missions, right? And they, they set up a booth and witnessed to people that come through the fairgrounds. And... Uh, Matter of fact, they met Bill and Carrie Francis <laughs> over at the fair, and they told them about Shining Light, and lo and behold, Bill and Carrie showed up and ended up coming to our church. So uh, not only did people get saved over there at the fairgrounds, but the Lord used them to bring. But anyway, they, they live in South Carolina five months out of the year and over here seven months out of the year. And they love our church, and they've been faithfully coming. And they would like to unite with our church on the associate membership um, and so all in favor of, and they have both been saved and baptized, and he's even been ordained, amen. Yeah. So uh, all in favor of receiving Ralph and Linda into our membership as associate members, say amen. 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 All right. And God continues to add to the church, amen. So we're, we're going to ask you folks and Noah to step over here. All three of you can step right here in front of the stairs, and we ask everybody to come forward. Shake hands, extend the right hand of fellowship to the Copelands and to Mr. Noah. And then uh, if you're here to eat, just make your way right over into the fellowship hall. Find a seat. And uh, if you can't stay, uh, we're certainly sorry because you're going to miss out on a good meal. But anyway, we understand. Uh, may the Lord bless you. We'll be back tonight.
Uh, we're going to be continuing in the book of Acts and starting chapter 5 tonight. And so I hope you'll be in your place tonight. Let's bow for prayer. Brother Clark, would you close us in prayer this morning?